civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Rimini meeting. We have um, very little time available, and we have uh, lots of guests. So, our passion for the person. This is the title of this year's edition of the meeting. This is an expression of Don Giussani that he used in 1985 on the occasion of one of his contributions here at the Rimini meeting. So, passion. This is going to be the topic uh, uh, of the discussion of this specific session. And we're going to address uh, the topic of passion from the point of view of uh, education. We're going to listen to what Mr. Buzzati did uh, of the meeting with Dino Buzzati through his works. Uh, actually, um, in the experience of uh, students and pupils. But we're going to address passion also from a different perspective. We're going to talk about educational relationship, uh, an educational relationship uh, uh, made up of answers, questions and answers that speaks directly to young people. And we're going to talk about uh, uh, a story that started 20 years ago in 2002, probably even earlier, as Professor Gilberto Baroni will tell us. So the colloqui Fiorentini, these are a proposal, uh, a working proposal addressed to uh, students uh, um, every year. Students and pupils are suggested, are recommended the reading of a specific author. And then at the end of their analysis of this work, uh, they're called upon to draft a dissertation. And this dissertation is going to be presented uh, on the occasion of a conference in Florence. Some of the works, some of the most deserving works are then uh, awarded with a, a prize. Uh, we have, for example, here with us Daniel Venturi, a student of uh, uh, the Scientific Lyceum uh, Piggy in Rimini, he was awarded with the special mention of this year's edition for the uh, uh, for the narration uh, for the novel called uh, uh, for the short novel, sorry, called La Panchina, the Bench. So this is more or less what the Colloquio Fiorentini is all about. We're talking about 21 editions of this Colloquio Fiorentini that year after year have been devoted to a renowned Italian uh, authors uh, like Montale, uh, Ungaretti, as well as many others. If you have a look at the website, you will well understand what we're talking about. We had about 500 people registered in 2002 and over 4,000 people on the occasion of the last edition before the pandemic broke out. Then after the pandemic broke out, uh, uh, lower uh, numbers were registered, but still they were quite remarkable in spite of the pandemic. So on the one hand, the colloquy Fiorentini are a different way of addressing teaching. 
and basically the heart of man and his or her passion for existence and his or her destiny. On the other hand, they are also a privileged standpoint from which the world can be viewed. And we're talking about the standpoint and the perspective of pupils and students. The more and the deeper we delve into the experiences of uh, young students and pupils, the more we realize that this proposal is something really important and really forward-looking when it comes to the perspective of young people uh, in addressing uh, the most uh, important and serious challenges that address uh, uh, young people uh, like anxiety or fears as if uh, these other challenges represented a real uh, and yet another pandemic. So we invited some of the protagonists of the Colloquio Fiorentini to try and ask them what they have gone through this year to better understand the real nature of this adventure that they've been engaged in for over 20 years. So I would like to introduce you Professor Gilberto Maroni. Baroni, sorry. He is the founder of the Colloqui Fiorentini, and he is also the president of the Association di S. Firenze e Toscana, which is basically the promoting entity supporting uh, the Colloqui Fiorentini. Then we have uh, Pietro Baroni, the son of Professor Gilberto Barini who in turn is a professor of Italian and Latin and the director of Colloqui Fiorentini. Then we have a member of the steering committee of Colloqui Fiorentini, also he himself, a professor of Italian, Tommaso Pagnifedi. He's going to talk about how the experience of the Colloqui Fiorentini uh, induced him as a student to engage more actively in the Colloquio Fiorentino. Then we have Sara. She participated for three years, and this year was actually her last participation in the Colloquio Fiorentini. And then, connected from remote from Sardinia, we have a university student who's uh, uh, a university student uh, and who's currently uh, studying uh, a subject that apparently has nothing to deal with the Colloquio Fiorentini. We have Michele Spissu connected from remote and specifically from Sardinia. So I'd now like to leave the floor directly to Gilberto, Gilberto Baroni, so that he can tell us a little bit more about uh, the Colloquio Fiorentini, about the inception of this initiative and the evolution it has had over the years. You have the floor. Thank you very much. So the study of the Colloquio Fiorentini. We have a formula that is basically the expression of uh, this conference uh, that basically says the following. Uh, you get a story from an event and uh, you have uh, a group of teachers uh, in other words, we are not a congress organizer. We were not born. The Colloqui Fiorentini were not created simply because we uh, actually were kind of uh, fixated with literature or didactics. We were not created uh, following a specific event that kind of uh, um, happened to us and engaged us or convinced us. And actually, this event is better expressed with the words of Don Giussani. Don Giussani basically says that actually there's a f for everybody, there's a fact. And that fact has been significant. And that fact has influenced the whole of their life. It has, in a way, enlightened the way that person has felt uh, and, and, and done. And this is what we call event. I was a young boy, and many years ago, I was engaged 
in completely different uh, thoughts and activities. But I happened to experience this event. And this event uh, was indeed very important. It gave me the certainty that if that event had reached me, well, then it could have reached, uh, it could reach everybody, irrespective of one's personal, cultural, or family situation. And I would like to use the words of uh, Karofos Gruber because I believe that his words can uh, well express uh, what uh, the event, what this event meant to me. Fultz Gruber basically explains, talks about his experience. He said, and I quote, we had something new in our hands. We had a secret. And that secret we had to communicate to everybody because it was the secret of the person, the secret of the person that had been revealed to us as young boys and girls as we were. And we were actually getting the baton from that. Ordinary life meant uh, being suspended for this conscience. And actually, I felt myself perfectly described by these words. I mean, this is precisely what had happened to me as well. I mean, feeling suspended, having my breath held because I realized that I was dealing with something new, something new that had reached me, even if I was completely uh, foreign to this world. And I felt the need that we had the secret to tell everybody, to communicate to everybody, because that was the secret of the person. When I think of all the leading personalities in the realm of culture, when I think of how many um, renowned personalities who were actually l were looking for their last secrets, like uh, Montale, for example, like Eugenio Montale. They only uh, wished for this secret without uh, grasping it, without knowing it in detail. And actually, we, myself, uh, we had been communicated this secret. Of course, I had to feel myself suspended. I had to kind of hold my breath because of this. So allow me to share a couple of uh, important words with you. The first word is meeting, and the second word is the word destiny. Meeting. The, world, the word meeting uh, completely uh, disrupts the whole cultural um, order when it comes, for example, to the university order or the university structure or the school structure, uh, the university, universities and uh, schools are based on analysis. Um, but in my personal case, it was the experience that basically led me to knowledge through the meeting, through this meeting. And that is because the meeting would, in a way, uh, announce the destiny of the person. My wish to teach was uh, due, was generated by this uh, uh, need for me to communicate. So I wanted basically this to, to be conveyed to my students as well. I was a professor in a Technical Institute for Tourism uh, in the suburbs of, uh, of Florence. So teaching literature, starting from these two main concepts, the concept of meeting and the concept of destiny. I mean, starting from these two concepts uh, would enable me to convince and to involve even students who were coming from different uh, contexts and different experiences, which were very much material. However, during classes, 
I had a very peculiar perception because it seemed to me that the walls of the room of the classroom uh, would dissolve and that we were in the very heart of uh, every person's lives, be they contemporary or be they uh, our ancestors. And my students could, in a way, perceive this destiny. They perceived that this destiny had to deal with them as well. Actually, the destiny would awake them again after having been blind for so long. So how did I teach literature? Flannelly O'Connor used to say that in schools, uh, do, uh, there have been generations of students induced to uh, think and to believe that learning uh, means eliminating mystery, and together with mystery, also destiny, also the, la the last secret. Uh, even what's most personal that uh, we have in us, that uh, belongs to us the most. Literature and art in general, however, have uh, are also go hand in hand with ideology. Ideology creates a uh, um, whole comprehensive models and reality has to fit in these models. However, art is sometimes, sometimes corresponds to, uh, corresponds with forgetting ideology. So, for example, Verga, who was a positivist, uh, used to say that uh, the humble, the simple, human factor will always induce people to think. However, if positivism means a culture that aims at dominating reality, if positivism, if rationalism are a culture that expresses, that express reality by uh, turning mystery into something uh, marginal into something that is secondary, of secondary importance. If positivism is something that kind of uh, uh, depletes uh, reality itself, well then, how could Verga say that the very simple human fact will always induce people to think? If this is the case, then this means that there is something that is undepletable, uh, and this has to deal with the infinite, and the infinite has to deal with mystery. So in my classes, moments of silence, extraordinary moments of silence would occur. There was a day on which uh, um, I seized a favorable occasion. I saw that there was the possibility also of uh, communicating, of talking, uh, um, of communicating with other schools in Florence to tell them what, w what was taking place in my classes. And this is how the Colloqui Fiorentini were created. They were not created based on a project. They were based, they were, they were created based on the experience of a teacher who was actually teaching literature every morning going to school. How can t literature be taught? I would like to read out a quote by George Steiner. Students should be told not to read critiques, but rather to read texts. Because reading critiques, so reading secondary texts, means being passive as if you are sitting in front of the telly. It means that you are renouncing the responsibility of your actions. And then he goes on and said, and I quote, a serious act and a deep act of reading will change your life. That's a meeting. That's the meeting with uh, an unexpected appearance, uh, as if you were meeting your lover on the street or, uh, for example, your, uh, your enemy. If we read the texts of critics, we are not studying the authors, but we're studying the critics of the authors. If we read, for example, the 
uh, pieces of works of the anthologies of the authors means that we are basically reading uh, the selection of those who chose those specific texts. What we propose is to read at least one whole work, one uh, whole piece of work of the selected author. And because it is precisely there that you have the real presence of the author. And this leads me back to the uh, word I was uh, mentioning at the beginning. So meeting, because studying means meeting. So for example, if you think about Dante Alighieri and Virgilio, Dante met Virgilio by reading his works of art because Virgilio had lived 1,000 years before, but he met Virgilio in such a way that he was able to feel Virgilio more contemporary than his peer, uh, his contemporary author. So he met a man who lived 1,300 years earlier than uh, for example, his relatives or companions of his time. And so we invite, uh, precisely in the same way, we invite our students to meet authors. How can you meet an author if not uh, starting uh, from your own needs and your own experience and your own personal situation to then understand the questions posed by the author and at the same time in order to receive an even brighter light from that same author. Many of our students actually told us that Buzzati has become a companion for them. This is just a, I mean, by way of example. This method is something that we first and foremost uh, uh, proposed to our colleagues, and we could summarize it in the following way. It's the, the person, the I, the self in action. Not so much uh, cultural categories or the anthologies by critics. We have always proposed, uh, for example, D'Annunzio, Lopardi, Pascoli, because in this way, you're going to meet a person while uh, streams are just obstructions. Uh, Maria Zambran used to say that obstructions uh, is a view, uh, is a glimpse that has kind of ceased to see things. Uh, what we intend to do is to put the author in the forefront and to focus on the relationship that we can establish with that person, the questions we ask him or her, and the other way around. And, this, and then this hour of class becomes a, a dialogue between the teacher, the students, and the author, and so on and so forth. For those who have um, uh, made this experience, uh, it is possible to say, like uh, one, of, uh, uh, colleague, one of my colleagues from the market region said, there was a moment in my life in which I was not even able to wish for the most authentic things. And in that precise moment, the unexpected experience of the colloquy Fiorentini came, uh, which was uh, um, unexpected, and that uh, gave myself to me. And actually, she was participating in a conference on literature. So the Colloquio Fiorentini gave myself back to, to myself, basically. And the same thing, the same concept was expressed by another friend of ours, Roberta, who used to say, and I quote, coming to Florence means involving myself in the first person with my interests, with my questions on the authors in the school, as well as on myself, on my personal life, and on the lives of my pu pupils, on the students entrusted to me. And this is something that has always given me a lot of impetus, which means uh, basically on questioning uh, on everything, on my family, friendship and my relationship with things. 
there was a time in, uh, in which I was presented, I was presenting the colloquy uh, uh, Fiorentini in Milan, and actually we said that this is what happens in Florence, and this is what happens during the colloquy Fiorentini. Simply to highlight how the method of the colloquy Fiorentini, the method that we propose to our students, uh, is something that is. Uh, capable of awakening them again. They become uh, more aware of uh, life, uh, life as a novelty. And this is something that we propose to students, to teachers as well. For example, Nicoletta used to say, and I quote, this year, through uh, the experience of the Colloquio Fiorentini, I have given the, ch I have been given the chance to um, experience the beauty of this job that I convincingly chose when I was a younger teacher. Uh, you may go through years uh, and you may uh, kind of uh, uh, be uh, depressed by bureaucracy, by useless projects and so on. And she said, actually, I experienced again the beauty of this job that I convincingly chose as a young teacher. The novelty is not represented by the author, but rather by the fact that once you learn the method, you uh, become brave, you become courageous, and you start questioning yourself. What we ask students, that is to say, reading and posing questions to themselves and the authors, and I got surprised by the fact that I did the same with myself in the first place. So, I mean, this uh, is the re of the self and not the re of abstractions. And I might anticipate what others, what the students might say, but there was a student from Bagnaripoli who wrote to her professor. She wrote to her, I've always thought that uh, uh, going to school would um, in a way, and not annul me in a way, would nullify me. And that is the reason for which I have often hated school. And I've often hated the clock waking me up every morning at seven o'clock to remind me that I would have had to go to school. And yet, in the three days of the Colloquio Fiorentini, surprisingly, I was really looking forward for that clock to uh, waking me up. And this is something that was unexpected for me. So this is something that happens. I would like to draw to a close with uh, the words pronounced by our friend Ida. She thanked us and said, and I quote, uh, thank you very much for these days who have uh, been so important for myself and for the people who have been involved. They've been days uh, on which we have uh, had the chance to meet the event that we are and that we bring to ourselves. So thanks a lot for giving us the possibility to kind of shed light to uh, focus on the colloquy. I would like to draw to a close with these words by Antonella. Thank you very much uh, for your work. And I believe that Don Giussani uh, up there in heaven is enjoying himself as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like to start from one thing that you just said, quoting one of the professors who used to say uh, this gave back myself to myself. So basically, I discovered what I actually was. So I'd like to ask to Tommaso, sorry once again for having pronounced in a wrong way your surname earlier, and I'd like to ask you what happened to you, so such an important and radical experience that led you to uh, try to go through a certain path on your life. So please share with us your experience. So first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Let me start by thanking uh, the uh, thanking the organizers uh, for having invited me here for this very important uh, opportunity that I have here, and it's important for me to talk in front of this audience of the meeting. Uh, so I'm very pleased for this opportunity. With my speech, I just would like to share 
what the colloquy Fiorentini represented for me as a student before and then as a teacher, as a professor. So uh, let me start with a short remark. When I took part in the colloquy Fiorentini the first time, it was uh, 2012. It was my last year in high school. It was uh, uh, in that edition we focused on Ugo Foscolo and it was a very particular period in my life. I remember I, at that time, I was asking myself a specific question that I've been thinking for a while. And I was asking myself, continuously asking myself, who am I? So apart from all the uh, images and ideas that I would have had about myself, about my future projects, so who am I in the reality? That was the question. And the idea that I had, uh, well, at the time I was influenced by some uh, works that I used to read, and uh, I thought that I could have found the answer to this question by staying alone. Because I thought that uh, cutting all relationships with all the people I was living with, I would have been able to uh, get away from those images that I was usually uh, focusing on. But when I took part in the colloquy Fiorentini, I actually realized and discovered a reality which, is, which was actually showing the opposite of what I was thinking, actually because I was uh, facing uh, 1,800 students, and at that time we were talking about 1,800 students, and that figures grew uh, edition after edition. And together with the professors, to the, together with the teachers, we, they were all there studying the works of, the, of Ugo Foscolo, the author, and basically they were uh, being asked by the contents of the works themselves, so by the ideas of the authors about the life, the death, by his questions and his answers, and focusing on those contents, on those contents. And as Gilberto just said, in this way, they, they were able to uh, check and verify not only the reality within the texts themselves, but also in their own lives. And through this practice, uh, focusing on the author and the text, I kept on seeing people uh, growing and discovering more and more about themselves, and that was what I was looking for. So uh, I've been amazed by this sentence that uh, uh, ended the first speech of a professor that basically in order to uh, explain the works of Foscolo during the last li years of his life, said it's not because of the man doing everything by himself that he can find himself, but only with through a real dialogue and real love you can find yourself. And focusing on those concepts, so basically asking, answering to the question, who am I? Well, I understood that it was not possible to find an answer by myself, being alone. and. This was confirmed by the experience that I was living at the colloquy of Fiorentini. So the relationships with, uh, with Pietro, but also with many other friends with whom we were discussing apparently about Foscolo, Ugo Foscolo, but at the same time I was realizing that in that way I was actually showing the real Tommaso, who I actually was. So I, I realized I was discovering more and more new aspects about myself. So starting from that point, starting from that experience, this became for me a kind of a criteria that led me to uh, make all choices through my life. So I, I started a real path to discover myself. And after I finished the high school, I decided to attend university. And uh, I realized that focusing on the most important authors of literature, I would have been able to discover more and more about myself. So I, I started also uh, a path of faith. I was not actually uh, following the movement of Comunione and Liberazione before. But at that time, I realized that my life was uh, to be 
invested for a good faith, a good destiny. And after the university, after I finished the university, I, start, I decided to start teaching because I was really looking forward to share the dialogue that I actually uh, had with the most important authors of literature to share that with my students, exactly what happened to me uh, during that experience at Colloquio Fiorentini. And this year I took part uh, in this event with a group of students and uh, it's been a kind of a confirmation of this experience. The most important moment for me has been when uh, we met in order to discuss together the reactions we had uh, facing the works of Buzzati. And uh, I remember a student who used to say, till this moment, I used to have a relation as uh, an instinctive relationship with people and things, while I'm discovering now to have such a deep impact, a deep a reaction which is basically waiting for happiness, exactly like uh, I Conigli Sotto la Luna, which is a work from Buzzati, and they are waiting for happiness. Or another student, again, who used to say, I'm attracted by the mystery of reality, exactly like the characters uh, of Buzzati, but I'm kind of scared by that, and I don't know how to get out of this. And the very last example I'd like to quote, I remember a student who used to say, I'd like to understand why for Buzzati in his work L'Amore, he is stating that there is something else within love uh, more than just uh, having someone loving you. So all these questions, all those questions became kind of uh, a key point in our classrooms and we started a real dialogue in order to discover more about the students uh, also through other works uh, apart from Buzzati's works always aiming at a real meeting with the author as Gilberto was saying and I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, this is possible only th thanks to the fact that uh, uh, this is shared with the uh, professors of the didactic committee. We are about 40 teachers, and uh, periodically we meet and we uh, discuss about the author of the year. We met also this morning, and also we discuss also uh, about other aspects of the life school, the, the school life. So uh, we became kind of friends, and we are uh, aiming at dealing more and more with the most important authors of literature and also with our students. Thank you. Well, I would like now to leave the floor to uh, Michele. And I'd like to ask uh, Michele from Sardinia. You are a student at the second year of uh, physics at the University of uh, Pisa. So, oh, why? What's your experience about the colloquy uh, Fiorentini? Please share with us your experience. Uh, you are a physician and uh, you are talking about the colloquy Fiorentini. Thank you for, have, for giving me this opportunity to share with you this uh, uh, opportunity. And I'd like to sh thank also uh, my professor that at the time uh, took part in the colloquy Fiorentini with me. Well, the meeting with the Colloquy Fiorentini started two years ago. It was my last year at the high school. And why did I decide to do that? And why am I still taking part in the Colloquy Fiorentini despite attending the uh, University of Physics in Pisa? Well, since the very first moment, I realized that the Colloquy Fiorentini were an opportunity to discover myself a person, as a person. This was an opportunity to face my human aspect in front of the reality, facing the reality. So through all my, during all my years at the high schools, I kept on asking myself important questions. And until that very moment, I've never been able to uh, give myself a real answer well, after the meeting with the 
you mind it with the colloquy Fiorentini and with the three people with which with whom I shared this uh, journey this this has been a real uh, revolution for me it's like the meeting between Dante and Virgilio so it's like having someone uh, showing me the real and the good path so today we are living in a period of debates and this is a kind of uh, very simple and easy word, but I think it's a kind of uh, violent word because every one of us is uh, very convinced about many things where there's no space for the uh, for mediation for the reality, eh? and it's like as if the most important thing is just to win the debate and nobody actually cares on the real logics of the debate which is the dialogue basically through words and through the dialogue through the words uh, i think that uh, the colloquy Fiorentini made me a real man starting from dante and then through all the literature i think that uh, what you learn at the colloquy Fiorentini can be applied to all your life, also from a scientific point of view. It's being, it's like being focused on the most important heritage of science. So basically, continuously questioning your own life in order to uh, experience a, uh, a real life, something real. And. This can happen uh, from in di many different ways, talking with friends at the, uh, at the bar or with a song or reading a book or on all kind of speeches. Also, the fact of being here in this moment sharing with you my own experience, I think this meeting is the actual uh, realization, development of my own reality, what makes me face myself and wh what makes me get closer and deeper to that feeling of love that uh, Buzzati is talking about in his work. This year, uh, next year, the colloquy will be focused on Calvino, and the title uh, comes from Il Cavaliere Inesistente. And that's very important important and interesting to understand how Calvino focuses on this topic, saying that the truth uh, that we are looking for is basically coming towards us. So it's a kind of a run made of waiting for something. And I think this is the, the, one of the key points of the Colloquio Fiorentini. Basically, the reality is coming towards us. We are waiting for it. But during this waiting, we are, we are proactive. We are not just there waiting in a passive way. This is not something made of uh, uh, fake aspects, but this is something real. So, of course, for me, the Colloquio Fiorentini have been have represented much more than a simple context, but uh, it's been a real opportunity to meet my and to find my human, real human aspect. This is something you can live just within a group and meeting the author, meeting the other people of the group makes you face your own reality, your own humanity. It makes you face your own limits as well. And uh, I'd like to conclude by focusing once again on Dante because this was my first uh, meeting. And uh, let me say that at the beginning I also had uh, many different doubts uh, coming out from this experience. And I remember a letter stating that uh, the main goal of the work is to find a real state of happiness. And, well, I remember at that time we were kind of uh, doubtful, because who can say that you that can actually teach happiness? And despite that, I remember we decided to read that work, and we realized that in that case, the experience of being a, a person was an, a, a real, honest experience. And thanks to that experience, at that time, we decided to title our dissertation with a quotation coming from Dante, from uh, Inferno of Dante. And I remember that in that part of the of the work of Dante, Virgilio explains that there is uh, uh, 
a woman in heaven and uh, waiting for Dante. Basically, the, what I want to say is that the journey that Dante makes is a journey which is made of suf uh, suffering as well, but it is something necessary, which is needed. Often, we, we buy and we read uh, books just because we like it, and this is good, this is something good, for sure, there's nothing bad in doing that. Uh, and the same it is when we have a talk with our friends in the bar. But what the Colloquio Fiorentini taught me is that books have to be read because you need that. Even when they tell you something you don't want to listen to, you don't want to hear. And the same it is for these works that are real, that go beyond the just fact of uh, liking, the fact of reading. And you have to face yourself through this experience. Thank you, Michele, for, your, for sh sharing with us, for having shared with us your experience. I'd like to ask Sarah now uh, to share with us uh, her uh, experience at the Colloquy Fiorentini. So now you are about to start the university. Would like to sh would you like to share with us how you started this uh, experience and how you're gonna go ahead with this experience? Well, th this was my third year at the Colloquy Fiorentini, and I decided to uh, take part in, in the Colloquy Fiorentini at the beginning because I've been convinced by my professor. But then I decided to go ahead with this experience because I realized that the Colloquy Fiorentini uh, represented the real opportunity to grow for me and they brought me to find and discover the best out of me. And I was not doing something, this thing for someone else, but only for myself. Uh, the Dino Buzzati has been the uh, most recent author uh, and the one that I felt more, the closer to me. I started reading his works during that period, and the first work I read was uh, the uh, Tartar Step, and uh, I immediately found myself as if I was the character, the, the main character of this work, which was Drogo. He's a young soldier looking forward for many dreams to become reality, and uh, he discovers and he decides to uh, live his relatives and uh, live alone at the edge of the world. So he's a young soldier and I immediately uh, found myself as I was, as if I was uh, this character because I, start, I was starting my last year at the high school and uh, exactly like uh, uh, Drogo, I was full of dreams, of hopes, but also very uncertain and uh, with a lot of uncertainties and uh, ready to face a very important year for my life because I was about to make some important decisions for all my life, deciding my uh, university path. and. Uh, the Colloquy Fiorentini led me through this path because I think that without the Colloquy Fiorentini, I wouldn't have been able to uh, make to, to make this decision and uh, to realize that my dream is to teach, as if uh, as they are doing in the uh, Colloquy Fiorentini, with an innovative method uh, leading you to to change, but even to improve not only yourself, but also the relationship that you have with the entire world, because as Aristotle is saying, uh, we are social animals and uh, we are basically uh, living together with other uh, people all over uh, in the world. And we need to be able to have a relationship with other people. And as Hegel is saying, only the others uh, allow us to improve ourselves and to achieve the best and to, to to get the best out of us. Drogo is uh, within this uh, fortress, is in this fortress, and it, it's an, an import, very important character because that, uh, he played a very important role for me because at the end of this uh, uh, novel, Drogo is basically dying, dying alone, very old, is like of kind of frozen in the Bastiani fortress, which is 
uh, a fortress where, where he is living alone, completely alone. And I realized, I realized in that moment that I, I don't want to, to, do, to have the same approach that Drogo is having, and I don't want to share the same end that uh, he has in this novel. So th that's the reason why I'm here today, because mm. Drogo, well, Busati, pushed me to challenge myself and to work in a more proactive way and to give a deeper meaning to my own life. And there is a sentence that I always remember and that I found in uh, in Dino's works, and uh, when I uh, when I talk about Dino, he is no longer just an author for me. He's, he became a kind of uh, a friend for me, a companion for my journey. And that's uh, in the 29th chapter of the uh, Tartar Steppe, where Busati talking about the two soldiers that are bringing the uh, dying body of Drogo out of the Bastiani fortress. And Buzati write, wrote the two soldiers were living their life as it was without getting too involved with the absurd uh, ideas. So basically, they were not too focused on uncertainties, anxieties, just because life needs, deserves to be lived as if every day is, was the last one. Always keeping in mind that our life is very short, it runs very fast, and for this reason we need to live our life uh, as if every day was the last one, giving a real meaning to every single second in our life. And I also found myself getting closer to another character from uh, Buzati's works, uh, which is uh, named in the last novel that Buzati wrote, uh, Un Amore, a Love. Uh, the character is Adelaide. And at the beginning, she is a young prostitute. And at the end of the novel, she finds a real love, Dorigo, and she finds this love that is a real love, not only for herself, but it's a love for someone else and with someone else, a real and sincere and truthful love, letting her grow and finally being able to uh, survive. So I suggest to all the people to try this experience of the Colloquy Fiorentini because it's a very important experience and I will never forget this, uh, forget this uh, uh, sentence throughout all my life because this pushes me not to be scared but to be brave day after day, being aware that life is short, that life runs fast, is running fast and we shouldn't be afraid of dying because death just re is there just to remind us that life is short. But as Bustati is saying, uh, life is a mystery and life is uh, calling us to go uh, beyond. There is something else, basically, also in the Bastiani Fortress, you can, which is at the, at the edges of the world uh, where Drogo can see the, the, the horizon. And that's what I learned from this experience and that I learned from uh, Dino Bustati, and I wanted to share that with everybody. Thank you very much, and good luck for uh, your university path, which is about to start. So, uh, Pietro, can you explain us, uh, what, well, talking about uh, Bustari, what it means to focus on an author uh, at the Colloqui Fiorentini? So what's the difference, basically, between just reading uh, an author, just reading his work, and actually focusing on the author the way you're doing that at the Colloquio Fiorentini? Well, uh, we should, I think the answer has already been uh,
provided by the previous speeches. But I'd like to start with the last uh, speech because I think that uh, she explained us the difference uh, of the method itself. Let me make an example. When you uh, teach uh, Leopardi at school, he is considered as the pessimism uh, author, historical pessimism, cosm uh, or other kinds of pessimism. So that's what it's usually taught at school. But it's very important and interesting to uh, realize and to know that uh, Leopardi never mentioned the word pessimism apart from just once in the Zibaldone work where he says that uh, we should avoid to teach pessimism at the young people. However, we have always been uh, saying and teaching that Leopardi is the poet of pessimism. So, well, basically, the author is there, but you need to see him or her. The author is there, but you need to listen to him or to her. So you need, we need to open our mind and our heart to really meet that author. Otherwise, we just repeat what we have been taught just to face an exam. So I think that what is clear here is that the author is talking to us, is speaking to us only if the in the classroom there is a real silence looking forward for his own words without actually sticking labels on that author just developed and provided by the professor to the students. So uh, we shouldn't rely on those labels for Leopardi, for Manzoni, for the other authors. So there is a way to, for me as a teacher, as a professor, to prepare and to be ready for that uh, lesson just reading the text, and I cannot decide that before. I cannot get ready to it before. And of course, this is a very demanding work. It's very challenging, but that's the way we should do. And for Buzzati, this is the same thing. Buzzati is not uh, an author which is t usually studied at the, uh, the high school, but usually They study Buzzati when it happens just because they are studying the uh, the mystery in literature. So basically, uh, professors basically uh, want to focus on some specific authors like Poe or Buzzati just to justify that topic. But Buzzati, in that way, will never be able to talk to the students. He will never reveal anything to the students. Buzzati, in that way, would can just say, well, it's true that there is the uh, mystery, mystery literature. But once you know that there is this mystery literature, when you ask yourself, who am I? How can this uh, knowledge help you? Well, maybe just to get a good mark at the, during the exam. But that's it. On the, contrary, on the contrary, our idea is what we just said, the meeting. Of course, we know that Buzzati is the author of mystery, but let's wait to talk about mystery. Let's start reading the texts. Let me just share with you the end of the work is set the messageri, which ends by saying, well, well, sorry, it's the story of this uh, prince, the, 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 the son of this king, that starts with seven people in order to try to go to the borders of the kingdom of his father. But the more they, they go through this journey and um, the more they get far away from this border, as if this kingdom was infinite. And by the end, they get older and they are old. They wake up and they, they realize that they will never be able to get back and to go back because they, will, they realize they will die sooner. And the very last uh, day, he wakes up and he tries to get to that border. And he says, there is a new, a new hope that tomorrow morning will bring me more far away towards those mountains. Once again, I'll go through this journey while Domenico will disappear 
from the opposite direction in order to bring that to the faraway city my useless message, a new hope and my useless message. Well, Buzzati here is saying us that if you don't go ahead, if you go backwards, life becomes a useless message. So go ahead in order to look for a new hope, which is a mysterious hope. The protagonist cannot explain what it is about. However, this is something amazing for him. Or again, the end of another very important work, Lo Sciopero dei Telefoni, where there is a strike of uh, people working uh, on the communication uh, tools. And basically, there is a mysterious voice at a certain point that knows everything about all the people on the phone. And at the beginning, it's something uh, scaring them. But then at the end of the story, they, they're all together singing together in a very uh, pacific context. And the work ends in this way. Well, who was this voice? An angel or an eternal spirit for adventure or the unknown waiting for us beyond the edge or just simply the hope, the very old hope, which can be found everywhere in unexpected places, even on a phone call, just to give a real meaning to the life of people, of the person. So you see the difference between representing Buzzati as the author of mystery and l letting him talk about hope, about mystery, about something which can actually give a real meaning uh, to each one of us. Or another important aspect is that uh, we're not just focusing on the words of authors, but through words, we're going through the path that the author is developing because, uh, of course, everybody talks about hope. Well, if you think about the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic, everybody was stating uh, that everything would have been fine by the end. but So basically a message of hope. But what is hope for Buzzati? So if you read, you just go through these hypotheses by yourself, for yourself. So first of all, do I have a hope? And secondly, is my hope an illusion or is it something which actually relies on something real? So reading Buzzati's works, you, you, you ask him for this thing. Basically, you ask Buzzati, what is hope for you? So that's why she was talking about Dino. So this, is, this becomes a real friend for you. This is a real friend sharing with you the most important word that he writes. So for Buzzati, hope comes from uh, beauty from reality, but beauty itself, what is the beauty? It's easy to, to talk about beauty, but uh, again, Buzzati states that uh, beauty is something terrible because it kind of attracts and scares at the same time. There is uh, a work which is called uh, Pleni Lunio saying that once again this evening the Plain in Luna, Plain in Luna Brighton, our, uh, our house, our home, I was talking with my relatives, we were talking, we were smoking, but I was aware of what was happening outside. So the, the full moonlight was there. This, one, this was one of the most perfect things invented by nature, and this was for free. And despite of that, I was there sitting in my house with my relatives, talking, waiting, smoking. I was kind of scared. I was postponing minute after minute. And then considering that scaring event outside there, I opened the wooden door which had been closed. And here, it's very important, the fact that it was closed, because we are scared by the beauty. 
And once again, the same phenomenon is happening summer after summer, year after year. And why is beauty scaring us? Because in front of the beauty of the moon, I asked myself, why does this beauty with no solution, this real poetry, this, why is it there? Where is it coming from? For Buzzati, beauty is never an end, an arrival. It's always a starting point, and this is why it is scaring. And again, he says, as for many other nights in the past, I would have loved to stay there for hours to in front of that, but at the same time, I was feeling that need of running away, as if it was too complex, too difficult for me, as if it was a risk. So at that point, facing these words, you start thinking, well, it is true that beauty brings you to ask questions, because this leads you out of your normal, quiet life. And again, beauty, for Buzzati, it is something scaring not only for the people living there, but also for the uh, pow powerful people. And uh, let me quote another story, another work wrote in uh, 1949, and it says, you, and you, you know that Buzzati loved mountains, the Dolomiti Mountains, and uh, he often talks about that. And he basically says that there's a law that uh, formally prohibits uh, to entertain with mountains. It uh, bans uh, people from climbing uh, mountains or to look at them. And this is basically what the legislator does, and this is pretentious. Probably this is excessive. Uh, and that's because the mountains are always to the north, day and night, uh, with their splendor, beauty. So we prefer not to look at them now. Maybe with some goodwill we might get used not to look at them in order not to, uh, uh, in a way, unsatisfy those who govern us, as if uh, mountains were excluded from ordinary life. But then sometimes, once in a while, uh, people look at the mountains, but then people immediately uh, watch away, look away from the mountains, uh, because be they full of clouds or with snow, we do not want to know how uh, compliant are uh, we with the laws that we cannot uh, understand, but laws which are made uh, to the good of ourselves. There are people who use, uh, who have excuses and who have even kind of walled their windows, if the windows look to the north in order not to be tempted to look into the mountains, and now they live more uh, with more serenity. And they are basically considered as uh, uh, an example of people who close themselves towards the north, actually. For Buzzati, beauty is a factor that destabilizes power. Power is afraid of beauty. Just think of the following. What if the school were a place in which beauty is experimented? And not a place in which you spend time uh, looking for the rhetorical figures of a poem. Of course, metaphors uh, have uh, a great importance. What if they were something, they, they are very meaningful, but only at the service of beauty and not as an end in itself to learn Italian? And then the word desire. Unfortunately, I am running out of the time a lot to my speech, but that's yet another word that is particularly important for Buzzati. Buzzati uh, knows very well that desire, like beauty, uh, lies at the very heart of man, and yet men constantly and daily fight against desire and beauty because he or she uh, basically constantly questions uh, desire and beauty vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, uh, achievements that uh, he or she has reached. Uh, there are lots of short novels that address uh, 
this topic. And there's one quote called Aprile 1945 that's basically a short novel concerning the Second World War, and that's a very topical short novel. I quote, of course, while listening to it, consider the Ukraine war or the pandemic. I quote, the war is over, there's now silence over Europe, and how happy are we? Uh, in the middle of the uh, lunch, my mother started crying, and nobody was uh, uh, capable of talking because it was happiness all over the world and peace. No more. No more, and God, we are so happy. So, dear friends, let's start sleeping again. Let's start forgetting death. Of course, one cannot but wish for the end of the war. Yesterday, we were young. We were ready for our destiny, but starting from today, we are no longer ready. So uh, we have good rest, white bread, we have uh, restaurants over the Gulf. These are nice things of a time for gone. But actually, there is a, a dark uh, ditch that separates us from the future. We, starting from today, we have become old and prudent, and we should have expected this, actually. What kind of happiness is this? Why are you uh, uh, keeping such a, a face? Why aren't you happy? You have to fulfill your duty. So what's more desirable than the end of a war? But the Buzzati says, no, not even that is, is desirable, because not even that uh, depletes uh, uh, wish and desire. You cannot expect happiness from the end of the world, and we are talking about the Second World War, and then mystery. There is a short novel called Inviti Superflui, entitled Inviti Superflui. Buzzati was the author of mystery. However, in Buzzati's works, mystery is very often not so much an enigma that is kind of revealed uh, in the end, uh, that is explained in the very end. And as a matter of fact, the uh, experience of this year devoted to Buzzati is uno che aspetta, one that is waiting for. And that one is mystery. Buzzati was a theist, and mystery for him was uh, meant the fact that in reality there is always someone waiting for you. At the beginning of a short novel called In Viti Superplu, Buzzati used to say, said that mysterious life, and the story is about two people in love, two young people in love, and he, the, the, the man says that the mysterious life that was waiting for us. So you have this perception of a mysterious life waiting for us. There, in that perception, for the first time, we had crazy desires, crazy wishes. I'd like to read out uh, an excerpt from a short novel from the first collection called I Sette Messaggeri, in which the, the, the short novel is entitled Di Notte in Notte. And Buzzati talks uh, the story of a young uh, man uh, who is going to war. He has to leave his town. And in leaving his town by train, uh, he looks at the lights of his town. And every light uh, is uh, for him a promise, a promise, a promise of love, a promise of a family, a promise of uh, future parties. And actually, he leaves all these uh, desires, these uh, wishes behind. His perception is that the city is kind of uh, um, sending him away from him. And he's uh, very sad because he's going towards a future of war, an unknown future, maybe characterized by death. And then uh, he looks up at the stars and says, and I quote, up until the last window, uh, window's lights uh, uh, dimmed off. And the noise of the train became a music, and then the countryside was asleep, and there was only the light of the stars. 
that light of the stars gave me less satisfaction than the light of the city because it was not talking about the nice life in towns uh, of love, of uh, ancient secrets. Stars used to have an immobile light. They, the stars for him were not very fascinating like the lights of the city. And yet, I kept looking at the stars, appealing to them. And actually, I thought that uh, there was an appeal coming from the stars to me. The stars were not so distant from us. They were not depicting monsters or, god or goddesses or gods. They were not rotating in the uniform f uh, universe following mathematical norms. But they were more similar to the unexplored space of the ancient wizards. Probably they had even forgotten the gravitational force and they were just stars, simple, humble stars, bright up in heaven. So from the stars, we were receiving a personal appeal, a personal request, which was very weak. And while I was continuing uh, the stars above, I felt once in a while that I was feeling hope. So unlike the stars or the moonlight, which are so generous as lights, the stars would encourage us to wish not so much for the joys of the world, but for more rare things. And as a matter of fact, I was, uh, I, I wondered if I, had made a mistake, probably the stars were too far away. And then, all of a sudden, I noticed that it was the same stars of uh, uh, myself as a child. They had uh, been shining bright ever since my childhood, and they were shining now over the sea far away where I was going to go. And they would shine uh, in nights, in the nights, and also in the future. And they would always shine when uh, history will terminate over the over my grave. So, uh, my faithful, loyal sisters, they would not leave me. I travel alone. They would not elude me with uh, offers to then disenchant me. All of the stars, all of these stars were um, an asset that nobody would take away from me. So I would fix especially one of them, which was beautiful and which was blue. So the light of the town were very humble as a comparison. I thought that actually the stars above would never betray them, provided that I would keep my faith with discretion. They would always accompany me night after night up until the night of my death. And even on that night, she would, the star would always escort me, shining above me. I will always look at this uh, blessed light. So while I uh, would elevate myself as a spirit without flesh. Thank you, Pietro. So what you've just read out uh, uh, is really wonderful. We have really zero time available, but I just have one question. What kind of value is given by the possibility that young people have uh, to access uh, authors uh, of this kind uh, in order to find something that kind of meets their, their needs. So what kind of value does this possibility have, especially for those 
who deal with another part of uh, this reality. In other words, the fact that in that reality, we can, uh, we can call that reality as a friend. So this is the question I pose to myself and also to you. Unfortunately, we have to draw to a close. This meeting has, uh, this session has a particularly important value. The meeting edition has an important value. And we can support the Rimini meeting through donations. There are counters for donations in the area of the trade fair. You will see the symbol of a heart with the indication Dona Ora. If you wish, you can leave your donation there only to these people. And then there's also another piece of news starting from this year, the meeting foundation. Uh, we'll give the chance to those uh, who uh, support, who donate for the revenue meeting, you can get uh, tax deductions on the occasion of the tax declaration. So we unfortunately have no longer time. I would like to thank my dear guests, uh, and I would like to thank you all for participating. Thank you. dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà, lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo.